Dean's lecture. Um, thank you for the invitation to present our work um, and for the opportunity to, to be here and, and talk a little bit about what we do at the Nature Conservancy. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Kevin Owen Lewis. I'm the Coral Conservation Manager for the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean Program. Um, I was hired originally um, to lead the coral restoration work and the reef resilience work for the U.S. Virgin Islands and have then since moved on to um, the wider Caribbean team. Um, with me here this evening is Lisa Terry, so I'll ask Lisa to stand quickly. Um, remember that name, that face, and that smile because I will be sending a lot of people to her um, to volunteer with a, a number of the different programs that we have related to our coral work. Um, so there are a number of things that we do uh, as a nature conservancy here in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And originally, when we started in the territory, we were a land acquisition organization. So we brought in um, to purchase land and set them up for protection and preservation. Um, our uh, management um, work has changed since then. We've become a lot more hands-on, on the ground, um, support for the local government and the uh, marine conservation strategies that they're um, interested and, and excited about doing um, and providing, uh, you name it, in, in terms of support to them, whether it's capacity building in terms of helping to bring in federal funding for different projects on the ground there or, um, or providing um, support for travel to their staff to go off and get um, training that they may need and the list goes on. Um, but there are a few projects that have been near and dear to my heart because I've been actively engaged in them. And those are the ones that I'll talk about um, this evening. Our sea turtle work at Jack and Isaac's Bay, our coral restoration work um, across the U.S. Virgin Islands and now across the world. Um, our um, group responsible sustainable seafood initiative. Pretty fancy shirts that you know, only a few lucky people have. Um, <laughs> and our, our bleach wash program, which um, unfortunately we're expecting a big year uh, this year, 2016, for bleaching. Um, so we hope to get a lot of, of you guys to help us um, keep an eye on what's going on around um, Detroit, and we'll have a, a group just like this on St. Thomas and St. John and help us out. Um, so Little Princess Estate, I'll begin there because that's the picture um, that's on the screen. This was one of those five o'clock we're getting ready to leave the office and we look outside and there's a double rainbow over the middle. It's a perfect view. Um, right out there with my iPhone and was able to capture it. I didn't have a fancy SLR or anything, but still, still get the gist of what we're looking at. Um, Little Princess is about um, 24 acres um, in a state, Little Princess. Uh, it's an old plantation estate and we manage it now. Uh, we have a number of trails that lead to the ruins that are on site as well as the trail that goes out to the beach um, uh, at Little Princess. Uh, I joked when I first started at, at TNC that I was gonna have my lunch on, on one of the trails or on the beach or whatever the case may be. Lisa can tell you it's always on my desk, typing away and eating. But still, you know, we get to walk in and leave. So every now and then we get the, the beauty of what is the state Little Princess. Um, another favorite preserve of ours is the Jack and Isaacs Bay Preserve on St. Croix East End. Um, Jack and Isaacs Bay is a 300 acre preserve. Um, the land was originally going to be developed for um, hotel and condos and all that fun stuff. Um, and eventually we were able to raise the funds um, uh, to a uh, big thank you to the Jakowski family for that. But we were able to raise the funds to protect the land um, and in doing so, also protect the nesting sea turtles that um, come onto the beaches and lay their eggs every year. Um, so I tease that I have a few offices. I have the one in Little Princess, I have Jack and Isaacs at night, and if you haven't been to Isaacs Bay at night, uh, it's, it's by far the most beautiful spot that I've, I've seen on Zoom for it. You have the rolling hills behind you to the north, and if you look into the south, you have nothing but it's beautiful starlit sky. Um, Mario, who most of you know that it just walked in, she's a good friend and photographer, um, and some of the shots that she has that should be in this presentation, but I couldn't round them together quick enough. Um, at, at Jack and Isaacs, with us working at night with this starlit sky, I don't know how she captures it, but it's beautiful. But of course, um, there are gonna be lots of opportunities for you to see it firsthand, um, especially if you were to um, come out with on one of our interpretive hikes or volunteer with us at Jack and Isaacs. 
Uh, so again, we got the, the property in 1999, um, and essentially we got it to, um, to manage it uh, and to preserve the land in its natural state and to protect the nesting um, endangered hawksbill and green sea turtles that nest on the property. Um, TNC maintains the trails and uh, provide, which provide access to the different bays, both Jack and Isaacs, but also the trail down to um, East End Bay. Um, and then we develop interpretive signs that we've had at uh, Isaacs, and hopefully we'll, um, we'll get some funding to be able to print some more of these signs and have them situated in our places throughout the bay. Uh, but this is the, the sign that we have at Isaacs right now. Um, it has lots of information on what you can find out there in terms of the, the plants and wildlife. Um, some rules that a lot of people don't like, but there are, there are rules in place. Um, no camping, no fires. Um, it's it's you know, to protect what's there. Um, and the contact numbers, if there was an incident with, with like a sea turtle stranding, for example, you can contact the, the STAR network and actually get someone to respond to help with the, um, the injury or, or safe turtle. Um, one of the things that we enjoy most about the time that I spend on, on Jack and Isaac's Bay is the sea turtles that nest there. Um, so since, since we purchased the line and even before then, we've been monitoring the um, amount of nesting green and hostile sea turtles at Jack and Isaac's Bay. Uh, and for this, we monitor Jack, Isaac's, and East End Bay. So with the three bays, um, we get a tally of how many turtles are there, um, and we do both um, four during the day. Um, a lot of it done by this guy. If you don't know him, it's Richard Gideon. He's our land steward. Um, he's about as Texan as you can get. Um, but anything happens to one of his dogs or one of our turtles, and complete opposite. Um, yeah. Um, Richard's great, and he has a group of volunteers that, that go out with him during the day and they, they do day monitoring for sea turtle activities. Essentially, uh, different species of turtles make different tracks in the sand, uh, and the activity that they do to lay and disguise their nest will give, um, give you a sense for whether or not the turtle has laid on the, on the beach. Uh, essentially, the greens and the, on the leatherbacks have, um, they use both front flippers at the same time. Um, the hawksbills alternate. And so with their gait, the track that they make in the sand, you can identify which species uh, the greens are going to be smaller, the leather racks are going to be huge, um, which species and whether or not they lay. So if you have tracks only all the way through and out, the turtle probably did not lay. You have tracks come in, sand is disturbed and kicked around all over the place, they probably probably did lay. And so in the beginning of the season, uh, Richard will go through with his volunteers and he'll get a sense for how many turtles have been used in the bay and they will prompt us for when it's really time for us to get volunteers to go up to the beach at night. Um, this is Hillary, she was one of our volunteers um, two years ago and she's actually in Sao Padre right now doing, working on her masters um, and, and doing sea turtle work there. Um, one of the good things about our volunteer program at TNC is um, you usually leave TNC as a volunteer um, and you either get a job at TNC or we help you get into grad school. And we've been doing this with a number of our coral and our sea turtle volunteer associates. Um, at night, Hillary, just like any of our other uh, volunteers that, that um, start for the night program, will monitor each bay, and we usually have one person per each bay. Um, so you have to be, um, you have to do well with working by yourself, um, alone on a secluded beach at night. And we've actually found volunteers every year for the last four years that I've been managing the program um, that have been um, amazing, uh, getting out at night from about 8 p.m. They look walk up and down the beach to look for evidence of a sea turtle arriving or a sea turtle already on the beach. Um, they record data from the, the size of the females. They apply flipper tags and inject a pit tag into the um, females so that we can, um, we can recapture them and we have data on growth rates and um, have a sense for how the turtles are used in the bays who are remigrating re back to um, Jack and Isaacs. Um, and there's a, a huge data set that we've been able to um, compile. And now we have a sense of the trends that are occurring on Jack and Isaac's Bay. Uh, in terms of our conservation work out there, there were originally issues with poaching. Um, and that's essentially been eliminated by the presence, our, the presence of our volunteers on the beach each night. 
um, ex excuse me, five nights out of the week, week we have volunteers on the beach. Um, mongoose have been reduced by a trapping project that we work uh, with the Division of Fish and Wildlife and uh, USDA and US Fish and Wildlife Service in partnership. Um, artificial lights, um, Jack's, at Jack's Bay is really the only place where we have an issue with artificial lighting. Uh, and we've been working with the Great Peak Home Owners Association about that. There's just one individual that we need to, um, to make compliant. Um, and we'll continue to work with them this year on that also. Um, and then in terms of fishery and boating interactions, um, because of the new designation or the designation of the Seaport Eastern Marine Park and the sea turtle zone um, that Jack and Isaac's Bay are a part of, um, that's reduced significantly, significantly the amount of boat strikes and other fishery related uh, interactions uh, that we used to see around the base. Uh, so I do a lot of this work. I'm, I grew up um, and studied and learned about marine science. I've always been fascinated about resilience. Uh, that's the ability of organisms or systems, uh, whatever the case may be, to be threatened um, and either not be harmed by the threats or to bounce back from an impact. Um, and I think this is one of the cool stories that we tell at Jack and Isaac's Bay is that it does work. Um, in the early uh, 1990s, we had less than 25 sea turtles nesting on the beach. Um, today, we have almost 300 turtles nesting on the beach. 20, um, 2013 was our spike. Um, and I think what you'll see now is where this was the average uh, historically. The average is now going to be up here somewhere around 2,000. 200 individual um, nesting per year. And these are individual turtles nesting, um, not just nests. Each turtle will make multiple nests. Um, that's, so that number would be a little bit higher than that if we were looking at just the nests. Um, unfortunately, we did lose 2011. Um, that was before I had been asked to manage a program, and I can't remember exactly what happened to the funding that year. Uh, but it wasn't available, and so we have this gap that we're not happy about. We do have the daytime monitoring data, because that was done for the entire season, but we don't have the actual confirmed number of individual females that nested on Jack and Isaacs. Um, that won't happen again. Uh, and so data like these um, are important not just for our sea turtle conservation work, but also for our core work, which I'll talk about in a little bit, because it really proves that if you remove the threats, um, poaching, mongoose, um, boating interactions, you can allow for organisms and habitats and whatnot to recover, to rebound, and to do you know, what, they're, what they should do naturally. If you continue to throw threats at them, and again, most of these are human impacts, you're gonna continue to see the, whatever it is, habitat organism um, decline, and it would eventually lead to their demise. So last year was an exciting year for us because I reached back out to my old university, Savannah State, and we got Emma Schultz on the left there um, as a master's, a candidate in the Master for uh, Master of Science in Marine Sciences program. Uh, and she did her thesis work on Jack and Isaac's Bay with us. Uh, she was interested in three things. She wanted to know, actually, she eventually got interested in three things. She had this long list of projects that she wanted to do for her master's, and we had to convince her that that's dissertation over there. Let's just focus on a master's right now. Um, but she wanted to look at how the population trends had changed over the time. Um, she wanted to look at satellite tracking. So where do the turtles move during nesting and then after the leaves and croy, if they're using croy. Uh, and she wanted to look at the genetics. How do the turtles that nest on Jack and Isaacs, how are they connected to the turtles across the Caribbean region? And she did all three. And she successfully defended on March 21st, 2016, I was present and was happy to sign out on her, her pass. Uh, Emma, one of the things that she, do, she did, as I mentioned, was to affix satellite tags onto six turtles. We, we did seven, the one tag fell off almost immediately. Uh, but that's true here. And there's actually a, um, a demonstration here. So this isn't a working satellite tag. Check that out. This is essentially what's epoxied onto the carapace of the sea turtle. Every time it's on the surface and it dries, it sends, uh, it connects to satellites and stay in the space. Um, they're dependent on how many satellites are active 
and pick up on the signal from the tag, you'll get a really good reading for where, where on Earth this turtle is. Um, so this is Emma again on the left. This is a group of volunteers that help us, um, with Richard again in there. Um, and this is one of our girls going back up to sea. And you can see the satellite tag with all of the actual instruments in it uh, and the battery. Um, the way that we have it configured, every time that that turtle is on the surface, the, tra the transmitter will try to send signals out. And um, with that configuration, we have about a year and a half uh, on the battery life. And so we'll continue to collect that on these turtles um, until the batteries stop working. Um, some of the things that we were able to find out with this work is that um, here's St. Croix in the middle here. So we have three turtles that have stuck around St. Croix. We have one that ventured out to Vieques, and we have two. One came straight to Nevis, and the other one, this is Annette, she went all the way around St. Martin, Antigua, and we thought she was coming back to St. Croix, and then she said it. <laughs> I haven't used that one before, but I'm, I'm going to steal that and use it. So Annette did the Leah thing to get to, to Nevis from St. Croix. Um, one of the things that, that Emma was able to determine or speculate from um, the data and uh, how, how good the signals were when she was near Antigua and Nevis was that she likely laid on both um, Antigua and on Nevis also. Um, so the notion that the turtles only lay on their um, their native beach might not be um, that strong anymore. Um, and we know from some other papers that have come out recently that it has been documented where a turtle will lay on a number of different islands, not just a number of different beach, beaches within the island. Um, we've also we've always known that our turtles share Buck Island with um, the Park Service. Um, some of the turtles that nest on Jack and Isaac will also nest on Buck Island. Um, we know that some of the turtles that nest on Sandy Point might also be nested on Machine or Shine Bay here on Sandy Point. Um, but we're also finding out now that turtles are nesting on different islands throughout the Caribbean. Um, and it's work like this that can really help, as we were speaking about earlier, about these different countries that still have um, seasonal um, take for sea turtles. Um, we hope that a lot of this work will help to prove that we have a regional Caribbean population for sea turtles. Um, and that will help turtles everywhere and not just here. Um, I mentioned earlier that we've had two, two of our tag turtles at Jack and Isaacs that have swam over to Nicaragua and gotten eaten so far. Um, the tags were sent back to University of Florida. They still harvest um, turtles legally in Nicaragua. Um, and one of the turtles that I tagged for my thesis work in 2005 in St. Thomas actually made it to Nicaragua this year also. And um, their fate was the same, but at least we're getting the tag information back and all of those stories with the satellite work, the genetic work come together to paint a really nice picture that we do have a regional population of sea turtles in the Caribbean that we should be better at protecting mm -hmm. across the region and not just on sea Um So that's going to be our mission moving forward is how, how do we um, get this information out so that these other countries that want to harvest their sea turtles um, know that it really isn't their sea turtles. So that was the gang. Um, just to give you a sense for um, for two additional turtles. This was Savannah, Savannah State University, of course. The first turtle was named Savannah. Um, and she nested on Jack and Isaac. She went up north around Green Key and Buck Island. Um, every now and then, she spent a lot of her time down on the South Shore, um, just east of Sandy Point, uh, at the Long, um, Long Point area. Um, and then this was Annette again. Uh, again took off and you know the engines might have gone bad so she stopped here for a little bit. Um, somebody made it to jump off here so they stopped and stopped again and then eventually made it to Nevis where she um, spent um, where she's been since. Um, and I the link www.cturtle.org is at the bottom if you'd like to track, uh, continue to track um, these turtles. I think we have three that are still transmitting. Um, you can look it up here there. Uh, if you type in St. Croix Green Sea Turtles in the search, you will find the full list and then you can look for them individually. Um, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see where they go from there. Um, switching gears to our coral conservation work, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we do. Um, corals, again, are important for a number of different reasons, like sea turtles are. Um, but for historical um, 
reasons everybody knows that St. Croix were two separate land masses with a waterway in between. Um, so a lot of the geology of St. Croix, in the, especially in the middle and outskirts, are actually calcium carbon. They're old um, quarry skeleton that are, are now bedrock. Um, again, that led them into the Little Princess um, office. Look out of our veranda when the plum boards in bloom, in bloom is, is spectacular place. Um, Jack and Isaac, as I mentioned, um, in terms of shoreline protection, the waves that you see breaking off on the um, the right side of the image are wave. Um, that's a lot of energy that is dissipated or, or dies out before it makes it way to the beach. The sandy beach that are important for us to enjoy, but also important for the sea turtles as a big part of their life history, is protected because of those quarries offshore. Um, recreational and commercial fishery, these quarries in general provide homes and habitats to a number of different commercially and recreationally important fish species and vertebrates like lobster. Um, and then the recreational dive industry, um, I can't tell you how many millions of dollars we, we get in the Caribbean in terms of people um, flying to the Caribbean to dive and to enjoy our, our beaches and our underwater world. You know, although they're important for a number of different reasons, they're um, on the decline because of a number of different reasons. Um, climate change and, and associated impacts like coral bleaching, again, which we expect to see this um, summer. If you guys have been paying any attention to the news, you know that the Great Barrier Reef got hit very hard last year and continues to be hit um, with, with coral bleaching. Um, and that's gonna make its way to the Caribbean this year. There are a number of other places in the Pacific, including Hawaii and a number of the other islands. Um, the new, new Caledonia, which hadn't seen bleaching ever, um, actually saw bleaching this year. So it's a pretty bad year this year. It continues, last year continues into this year. And um, yeah, we hope it won't be as bad. We've been saved in the past few years by a number of small storms that have came through and dropped the water temperature. Um, but keep our fingers crossed that that happens um, this year. Um, still have issues with illegal fishing and harmful practices. Um, the ban on the gillnet was the one really cool thing that I did while I worked at the Division of Coastal Zone Management for the PNR. Um, but people, of course, still use it illegally. This image was taken after the ban on the gillnet. Um, it proves that things are still happening. Those nets are particularly horrible for tearing out reefs as they were removed from the, from the water. Um, issues with land-based source of pollution. Um, if you were out the day before the trap launch this year, you knew that that was a mess. Um, everything that we do on land will eventually make it into the ocean. That's the way islands are set up. Uh, and so there's a lot more work that we should be doing um, to try to fix the issues with land-based source of pollution. Um, and the new kid on the block, the invasive land fish, this guy is called Spike. Um, we found him in one of our nurseries in 2010. We delivered him to the Division of Fish and Wildlife. They kept him in a lid jar, and he lasted for a month before he went away. Um, no fresh food, or no food, no water tuner, or um, no aerator, just a lid jar, and it lived for a month. They taste good. So, um, unfortunately, because of all of those threats, a lot of our Elkhorn and Staffhorn reefs today look like this. Um, they've undergone a shift from a coral to an algae-dominated state. So in a perfect scenario, Buck Island back in the day, you had this really bright yellow, bright orange Staffhorn of Elkhorn coral. It was all over the place. Um, and unfortunately, what you have now, this is actually an image taken of Boiler Bay, which was just as spectacular. Um, it's this green algae dominated, algae covered reef, the, the old skeleton remains. Um, and for most tourists, they're, oh, it's pretty, it's green, yay. No, it's not. Uh, it's, it's not supposed to be green at all. It's supposed to be a nice, um, robust yellow orange coloration. Um, eventually, all the things that reefs are important for, the structure that they, they make and that break wave energy that provide habitat for fish will erode away and you have a flat surface, um, similar to one of the reefs we're working on in Grenville and Grenada, um, where this reef over the years have been eroded to a very flat surface. There's no structure. The beach um, adjacent to it is eroded away. It's actually up, up to the dope road, which is the only thing buffering the ocean from the homes right behind it. Um, and so we've actually engineered some structures to place onto those reefs to recreate 
that structural complexity that you need and have actually outplanted corals on that so that they continue to grow and keep the structure up with climate change. Um, a lot of the work that we started for the coral restoration side of things started in 2009 when we received funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, I can't remember the USBI um, to sacred number, but we got $7.8 million for Florida and USBI to put America to work while restoring reefs um, around Florida and of course the USBI. Um, so we started with these underwater gardens. Um, we worked primarily with elthorn corals at the top left and staghorn corals at the top right and grow them, and um, for the elkhorns, we started with these um, cinder block structures, the regular 8 inch cinder blocks, with a puck and a pedestal to keep the coral even higher off the seafloor, and then we epoxy, it's in a two part underwater epoxy, the coral onto those pucks. The puck can then be removed and place our epoxy back onto the reef. Um, and then we primarily use coral trees, um, a lot of fun during Christmas time. Um, we get our Christmas uh, Santa Claus hats on and go underwater and take some nice nice pictures, um, but the ornaments are even more precious than what you would have on, on your tree. Not to say that your tree is a business. <laughs> yeah. um, but these ornaments are, are then the corals are then cut from the tree uh, and then used to outplant back on trees. And that's um, essentially what I'm showing here. Uh, that's Lisa to the top, to the top left. Outplanted some of our corals. Again, we use a two-part epoxy. And from um, these little guys that we all planted, within a year we had clusters that looked like this. Um, this elkhorn coral here, um, this is the puck, the cement puck on which it was all planted. The original colony was something like this big. Um, all of this happened in three years, and you can see where the coral is actually growing over the seafloor, also further cementing itself onto the reef. Um, and then this is one of our plots. I'll actually, um, I might show you some video of that that we. Um, we all planted and within a year it had recreated this um, really nice thicket. Um, so just quickly before we, we did all plant annual corals, we wanted to aim for the highest potential for restoration success. We spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, and a lot of money growing these corals within our nurseries and we didn't want to all plant them for them to die. So we looked for sites that we knew would have high resilience uh, and those would be sites that will either get impacted in the future and not be harmed as much. Um, we did that by running a system where we looked at the positive attributes and the negative attributes, and we wanted systems that had a higher ratio of positive to negative attributes. And what we found in the top five sites that we had, Broad Bay being um, number five, Eurogard and, Kent and Green Key um, being one and two, was that there's a direct relationship between the resilience or the quality of the reef site and the survivorship of our outlanded corals one year later. Um, Rock Bay is on the south shore, Night Bay is just east of Teague Bay, Cane Bay, everybody knows where that is, um, Green Key, everybody knows where that, right? that is, and Burgard Bay is um, that bay at the Buccaneer Hotel. So the little brown reef that you see all the way is breaking on, we've actually all planted elephant poles there and they're really great. So here's a video that I promise. This is the site of this site of KMA, the first day that we all planted it. Um, you can pick up that bright white epoxy on some of these corals. Um, it hadn't been overgrown with anything, um, algae coral or anything yet. Um, and this was the same site one year later. Um, we didn't add any additional corals to the site. It's what you saw in the previous video, is what we allowed to grow up. And again, this was a uh, thanks for looking at the um, And you'll also notice in this video that you have a little bit more fish than you did in the previous video. You had one or two downward fish um, swimming through, but now we have um, a lot more going on. The, the grunts and the carapace. Uh, this same site actually um, was impacted at about a year after we outcomed it. So a little bit after I think this video. Um, sea turtles use reefs to clean their carapace and their plastrons. So every now and then you'll see a sea turtle on a reef and <laughs> clean an algae off of his shell. Um, they do the same thing with the plastron if they're anything. And, and we had um, we've heard reports from one of the dive shops that we should check out the sites because they're 
dolphins playing and all kinds of stuff happening, and that site was, was impacted. Um, and within uh, six months, it had reattached because of how we outlined it in this thicket structure. It reattached on the seafloor and it grew back up. So if you swim over it today, it looks like it did in the beginning. Um, we learned a lot from the USBI and we translated that into our Caribbean strategy for reef restoration, which involves um, five main components, scale, uh, science, resilience, communications, and um, policy. Uh, so in terms of scale, we wanted to take our work from uh, pilot scale, um, from pilot to scale, where instead of um, five trees growing corals, we're growing fields of, of 20 to 50 trees, um, where we grew enough corals to make a, a real um, ecological impact. Um, we wanted to start working with other species of corals instead of just the elephants that were well, threatened. The endangered species, the list of endangered corals have increased um, with an additional eight corals. So we want to work with those species also. Um, in terms of scale, we also want to look at where else can we do this work in the Caribbean to really make a difference. I talked about the sea turtles and how much connected we are um, with corals and fish and other larvae um, uh, as a, a method for dispersing eggs and whatnot. We are very connected in the Caribbean. We have some models that, that show that. And then we wanted to be able to recreate these large thickets of reefs instead of just these isolated plots that, that looked amazing. Um, we wanted to learn from the past. Uh, Bob Stenick, if you guys aren't familiar with him, um, he's one of the, the best known coral reef scientists. Um, he spent a lot of time here on St. Croix. He started his career here in the 70s at the West Indies Marine Lab. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've run into um, since, since, since I became a marine scientist and when I was, was in school for marine science that have spent some part of their life on Sucroy at the West Indian Marine Lab. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get that kind of um, energy and, and whatnot back to Sucroy soon. Um, but this is one of the images that he took at, at Buck Island in the 1970s before um, the white syndrome disease really started to take its toll on the Elkhorn corals. Um, Stuff like our resilience analysis that we did for Sucroy shows us where the high relative resilient reefs are for the island, and it helps to inform where we outline our corals. So we do get a, a good return on our investment, and we do get good survivorship. And um, the other good thing about how we're outlining on the, the northeast corner of Sucroy is that our coral, as our corals grow up, reproduce, uh, that will help to recede the rest of the island uh, as the prevailing current runs from east to west. Um, we're learning more through experimentation on, on densities and how to outline so that you have a lot of, again, success. Um, and then most importantly, we're sharing this work with the rest of the region um, so that others that are starting projects for the first time aren't reinventing the wheel like we did um, seven years ago. We're working to also build for resiliency by removing threats, identifying what the issues are, and um, pinpointing what the threats are to be removed at specific sites. Um, we've launched our Reef Responsible Sustainable Seafood Campaign as a mechanism to reduce um, our impact to the fishing and create a sustainable fishing industry here in the UFBI by you know, cre creating the atmosphere where each and every person that's buying seafood is informed and they can make a better decision about the seafood that they purchase to either sell in their restaurant or consume as a consumer. Um, and then we're, we're pushing for the consumption of live fish because again, they taste great. Um, and they're an issue on the reef, and if you want to tackle that issue, the best thing is going to be to eat them. Um, and then community outreach and engagement. We try to find different ways to get the word out about our work. Um, we're where scientists kind of trying to do this, it, it, it's not always um, received well or gets out as far as it should get, but we've been getting some help from some community group people um, to really help to push our stories out um, so that people are informed about our work and can help to support us um, and even volunteer um, with us. Um, even our friends at Ivy Design who designed this piece, Wayland did, I gave him a picture of a coral the Elkhorn Coral, and we created this, this really cool piece. Uh, part of the proceeds from everyone at this cell come to support our coral restoration work. 
Um, and then the outreach that we get from it is amazing. That's what we, um, we really appreciate the most because we're reaching the, the non-choir. Um, so I'm sure you guys have heard environmental talks many times. Um, but what at IV Design is we're reaching just about everyone on the island that walks into that school. Um, and then Lisa was, um, was helpful in creating this patty coral restoration, coral nursery and restoration specialty dive course, uh, which we've launched in the Bahamas and we've also worked with a number of dive shops here in St. Croix to offer. Um, so after you are open water and X amount of prerequisite dives, uh, you can sign up for this course uh, and you'll learn everything there is to know about coral reef restoration and be somebody that can help us. Uh, within the, the nursery through one of the dive shops. Again, this is right there for all of the divers in the house that are interested in either volunteering directly with us or learning more about the Patty course. Feel free um, to lay it with her. Um, and then we try to find cool ways, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit, we try to find cool ways to get our story out. Um, again, this went out on um, our Pulse Green Science blog at the Nature Conservancy. Um, and it was really good that we took the day that we actually set up the plot that you saw earlier. Fishes are never served, and that they focus on the best choices 
and that restaurant owners, chefs, managers, and wait staff all educate um, themselves and keep educated about regulations and best practices. Um, this is what our list looks like. Our green, the good choice, um, are those that are um, that are um, pelagic, uh, that reproduce rapidly, um, and as a good alternative for um, for reef fishes. And this is actually a typo. I went to erase tilapia and I erased lionfish instead. So swap out the word tilapia with lionfish, and you have our good choice list. Um, the good go slow list means that there's either a size restriction or a seasonal closure for these um, these fishes. And then the don't eat uh, list are those that are federally and or locally protected and should never be harvested. Um, we share with restaurants, don't stress too much about all that's going on in the slide, but essentially we share with them the season closures calendar and I have a few on the, the table on the side um, if anyone's interested in taking one. Um, if you like us on Facebook, a Reef Responsible on Facebook, you have um, you can download it straight to your phone. That's what I do, um, so that if I'm ever in doubt, I can pull the app out or pull the, the image out and share it. Um, but it tells you um, when it's it's legal to harvest um, all of the different fish species, as well as our creek con and well. Um, we also prepare a guide for the uh, restaurants. There's an example on the back also. Uh, it's a flip book and has information of all the different um, species that are regulated here, including our dolphin, dolphin fish, which is a good choice. Um, the best choice, lionfish. Um, one of our go slow, uh, the spiny lobster, because it has a, uh, it doesn't have a seasonal closure, but it does have a size restriction. Um, you can also not spare fish for um, lobster and you cannot harvest gravid or pregnant or egg-bearing females. Uh, and then the lame snapper is on a ghost low list because it has a seasonal closure between um, April 1st and June 30th every year. Uh, and then this is an example of one of our don't eat fish species, the Nassau grouper. Uh, again, they're federally and food protected, and so harvest is not allowed. I haven't seen one in years here anyway, so. Have to worry too much about that. We share information on the different size restrictions. Again, all of these materials are available online through our Reef Connect website and our Facebook um, Facebook page. Uh, we share additional resources with all of the restaurants that go through our training, so they know where we got the information from and where they can get additional information from, um, as well as the Marine Stewardship Council website and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Uh, which for, for those um, seafoods that they're importing, um, they can use this resource to make sure that they're sourcing their food from responsible um, districts or, or states or, or um, um, companies. This is our list to date and it will be growing soon. I have a request from Galangal to come um, and do training there. Um, and we are expanding to St. Thomas and St. John this year. Uh, just reached out to my first supermarket, which really wants to be our, our pilot for engaging the supermarket industry. Um, so hopefully within the next few weeks, I will be in there and we'll be able to add Food Town to the list. Fingers crossed. And we hope that the program continues to go bigger and bigger and bigger so that um, <coughs> at the end of the day, especially as our next step is to um, roll in fishers directly as participants of the program. Whether you go to a restaurant, supermarket, or a fisher directly, you can look for one that has um, our logo um, nicely displayed, and you know that they've made the commitment to be responsible, be responsible. Um, the beauty of the program is that it's all voluntary. You cannot pay to be a reef responsible restaurant, um, so there's no bribing involved. It's, it's you know, restaurants, business owners doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, and recognizing that, that this is going to help to sustain their business um, into the future. And then in terms of our Bleach Watch, um, this is uh, just a few slides from the training that we provide, and you can actually do that online at reefconnect.org, www.reefconnect.org, um, on our Bleach Watch page. Um, and essentially, um, it was created as a sampling protocol where um, community volunteers can go into the ocean, um, observe bleaching or disease or whatever the case may be, and then submit reports to us to say, this is what I saw at an X date at this site. Um, Lisa, over the last um, 
Technicolor over the last year or so has done an amazing job uh, of making it more user friendly um, and has created the revamp to our web page and our materials as well as the mobile app which makes it a lot easier for you to submit data um, to us. And you can do everything from a full data sheet where you submit all these different data points on exactly what you saw to a quick yes or no I saw bleaching and you can do it with a click of a uh, finger on your smartphone. Um, to just what some of the healthy corals look like, again, this is alkaline coral. Um, this is uh, staggered corals, and your, your brand corals, and some of your plate corals. Um, and then if they're bleached, you'll see something like this, where the corals have expelled their Susan Belly guests. Susan Belly are a um, microscopic phytoplankton that lives within a coral tissue. It gives corals a color, it's pigmented, the corals themselves don't have a pigment. And so what you're seeing is through the colorless tissue of the coral onto the calcium carbonate skeleton that they build. Um, and, and when water temperatures re return to normal, if they do, um, the Susan Peller will come back to the coral and they'll be gained in color and look healthy and robust again. Um, but in some cases, the corals will actually die if, they work, if the conditions don't return to normal um, ASAP. Um, another example of um, Branch of coral that is bleached. It's a pillow coral. Um, again, healthy on one side and bleached on the next. Um, and then we share information on what diseases look like, so how you can differentiate between what bleaching it is and what diseases. Uh, in this instance, um, you have a little bit of both. You have the, the bleaching that's occurring, and then you have this black band disease. Um, on the inside of the coral, and then you have all this dead um, skeleton. Um, the surveys are pretty simple. Um, you start your dive, in total it, it takes about 15 minutes. Um, you start, you stop at your three minute um, interval. You imagine a three by three foot um, square on the floor. So you put a couple of these tiles together, and you tell us what you see in that square. You move on to the next one, and you repeat that. Um, uh, that all rolls into a data sheet that you can find again through our website. Um, if you look up our um, the Bleach Watch page, you get all of that information, um, and with that, you'll also get the instructions for how to download the app. In terms of volunteer opportunities in general, um, our contact number is. Any of you guys are interested, we have a sign up sheet on the site also. If any, uh, anyone's interested in volunteering with us or learning more about um, all of the work that we do, um, again, reconnect.org is the website that you want to visit. And for land conservation stuff, if you're interested in maybe some trails at Jack and Isaacs or um, helping out at Old Princess Estate, we're in the process of building a visitor center um, to help increase. Um, visitation to this to the Little Princess. Um, and we have really cool ideas for the walls, so especially if you're an artist or you have artist friends, um, please reach out to us about that. Um, I have something in here um, that the artist may want to see at Little Princess. Um, for our seagull conservation work, you can reach out to me directly. And for our core restoration at Blue Shot B, I work. Um, you can reach out to Lisa Terry. Again, the contact sheet is on the site. If you're interested, please um, sign up and get involved. And for those of you who <coughs> have work here, uh, make sure to pick up one of the Sephora this week. Um, issues out now because we do have a nice write up. Um, thank you to Suzanne for reaching out to that also. We do have a nice write up in the magazine this this, um, this issue. So share, share me scary. Um, with that, I'll. Uh, I'd like the approach because... Free touch with 